He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Al Persson, pastor at mascot.church, if you want to email me. Today, we're going to talk about some hymns that are found in the New Testament that the early church, early Christians used to worship God and to remember things. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head and it just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating? I know it's irritating. Sometimes you have to get another song in your head just to clear that one because it just torments you so much. Well, actually, while ever that can be an irritation, it can also be a tool if you know how to use it. Once you memorize a thing, you can uh, memorize it to a tune or whatever, and you can continue to hear that to remind yourself of what it is that you're saying. You can use it as, as a teaching tool. Use your brain as your friend, not your enemy, I suppose you could say. Well, early Christians did not have, of course, uh, uh, smartphones or the internet or, any, or, or anything of the sort, nor did they have libraries or books. It was just not possible for an early Christian uh, 2,000 years ago to do that. The printing press hadn't been invented. Scrolls were kept in the temple or there were copies of scrolls if you were Jewish in the synagogues. Uh, the library I have back here, my, a small portion of my books, uh, just would be unheard of back then. A printed Bible? Oh, goodness me. No chance. So how were basic doctrines, basic truths remembered and then taught? Well, commonly, the, they may have been committed to music or turned into creeds that people would repeat together. Hey, by the way, if you turned up today at a church uh, 2,000 years ago that we talk about in the book of Acts, you wouldn't recognize it. First of all, you'd have to learn to speak the language, but uh, you wouldn't recognize its form and its style and its music or anything. Nothing would be like anything that we today associate with the modern church. Now, the textbook that I'm using, the two textbooks that I'm using for this particular study uh, today are books written by Dr. Larry Hurtado uh, from my library. The first one is Lord Jesus Christ, a big, thick book. It's Devotion to Jesus in Early Christianity. The second one is How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God? Historical Questions about Earliest Devotions to Jesus, Larry W. Larry w. Hurtado. And um, I've had them for a while, and certainly the topic that I'm dealing with today, he goes into at length on this. Well, there are three passages in Scripture in the New Testament that many historians, uh, theologians, scholars believe were likely hymns or creeds that Christians would recite when they got together and that these were then added into or included into the writings of the, uh, in, of the apostles, particularly the apostle Paul, uh, but also others, but particularly Paul, uh, as he uh, wrote to the churches and then these became the books in the Bible called the epistles. So I'm going to hop straight in, but before that we're going to note something about the first two of these three. Each of these, we're going to show you the text, then we're going to show you that they're also arranged in what's called a chiastic pattern, or they are chiasms. What is a chiasm? A chiasm is a literary structure wherein the beginning part of the text corresponds to the ending part of the text, the next part of the text corresponds to the second last, the third to the third last, and so on all the way up. It forms a kind of uh, pyramid, if you will, a kind of uh, a triangle, if you, if you will. And uh, we use chiasms in the English language. We would say, winners never quit, and quitters never win. Or uh, one of my favorites is, never let a fool kiss you, or a kiss fool you. But chiastic structure is found all the way through scripture. It's the Lord Jesus Christ talks about the Sabbath being made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, one of the things that you find, and, and there are small blocks of text that are chiastic and large ones. One of the things that you find is that the middle point of the chiasm is often what the author is referencing. On this channel, by the way, I've got about six chiasm videos that were done uh, several years ago, and uh, they will point to the theory and the practice and so on of this well-known uh, literary tool. Now, when I actually looked at, into the background of these texts I'm going to show you today, almost um, a, 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 several uh, writers broke them down into chiastic form and said that's important because this is a chiasm here. So I'm actually going to replicate a chiasm that I found 
The first one and the second, I'll just show you the chiasm as it appears in the text itself. Well, the first one is a very well-known passage from Colossians. From Colossians, I'm going to pop it up on the screen, and we will read it and then look at the structure. He, this is the English Standard Version, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. If you're an aspiring hymn writer, this is a good text to base your hymns on. A lot of music we hear today is, it starts about, you know, with people. This is how I feel, Lord, and this is what you've done for me. You don't find that very often in the Bible, very, very rarely. God has instructed us and shown us how he wants to be worshiped and how he needs to be worshiped. And most of those passages are passages a lot like this one that extol his virtues and his glory and his holiness above anything else. So that's a pretty good passage if you want to write a song, see how you go. I'm not musical. If I was, I'd be writing a hymn uh, based on that. There are several ancient, uh, great, and even modern hymns that are based on these, but um, it's a, it's, I don't think we can ever plumb the depths of it. Now, let's look at the chiasm. And note, in this case, I've marked the chiasms off in color, uh, or the, the references, and I think you'll really enjoy this here. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So that's the first part of this passage I just read. Now notice the phrase, he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. Now that corresponds to the red at the end of the passage, and through him uh, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So in the top we have, we have uh, deliverance and transfer, and on the bottom we have reconciliation. Those two red bits correspond. The amber below, I hope you can see it on your screen, it's not very strong on my screen. Uh, for he is the image of the invisible God, that's the beginning of verse 15, down to the second last statement of the chiasm, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. See these two chorus, they, they, they uh, correspond to each other, they complement each other. Now look at the blue, the top blue, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And uh, look at the portion below. He's the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So in the top we have all things, the one below we have everything, preeminence. Now look at the, at the wine color, the darker red, portion 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and then at the end of verse 18, he is the beginning. So you see those two phrases correspond to each other. They complement each other. They say a lot of the same things. And what's in the middle? What have I highlighted in the middle and underlined? And he is the head of the body, the church. That probably would be the core, or that's the overall message that is given by this. Oh, the passage gives a lot, but there's the pinnacle of that message. So in this particular passage, it was a very likely a hymn or a song that was used to uh, teach and to reinforce the doctrine of Christ. Now you'll notice here a lot of theological things. Ladies and gentlemen, when I studied this passage I thought, there is just so much depth in these three, I, I don't know, I, I can't do justice to this in just one video, and, and, and I, I just, oh, I, I looked at it again and again and thought, there's just so much. All we're doing is just skipping along the surface and hopefully getting you interested in this. Now, the next passage is one from the book of Philippians, one of the best known passages in the entire Bible. And I'm going to pop it up on the screen, Philippians 2.15. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, 
though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now this passage is very powerful. It has its roots in the book of Isaiah. It has its roots in other parts of scripture and talks about how our at what our attitude should be like, but also what the Lord Jesus Christ is like. Now if you remember the first chiasm we dealt with on the previous passage, the uh, beginning and the end complemented each other. The second and the second last complemented each other, said similar things. The third and the third last, and then the top portions, they all worked together. Each, each wing of the chiasm, if you will, was like the other wing, said very much the same things. When I show you the chiastic breakdown of this passage, you're going to see something completely different. This passage contrasts and shows the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ and his deity. And you can see that in the chiasm that's to follow. So let me pop this up on the screen here. And again, I hope you can see this uh, and see the chiasm here. So first of all, we'll start with the red six, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay, so here we have the fact that he's humbled himself. He did not count equality. This is in his humanity a thing to be grasped. He was in the form of God. Now look at the one on verse 11, the end. And it talks about every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. These two are not complementing each other. They're contrasting each other. The one talks is in the position of his humanity, the other of his deity. Look at the amber. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. So when the Lord Jesus Christ came into the earth, he it was incarnated, he emptied himself of his glory. He was still God, but he emptied himself of his glory, of the praise, the worship that was due to him, and took the form of a servant. Now, what's the offset passage look like? How does it read in Amber Below? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So on the, the first Amber, we see the Lord humbling himself. The second Amber, we see all creation bowing before him, exactly the opposite. Now, what are the, the, what's the doublet at the top? And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And what's the opposite? Therefore, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now, you can see in this particular chiasm, that what's happens on, what happens on the first portion of the chiasm are all um, aspects of the Lord's humility and the Lord's service to man and his humbling himself. And you see who he was physically, um, probably use a better use of the word, who he was in his human, have to be careful here, you see him in his humanity. And on the second portion, you see him in his deity. On the one side, you see the unexalted Lord. On the other side, his exaltation take place. So I think you should probably just review this really quickly. Let me flick back very fast to the first chiasm. I don't want to get you too confused. Just going to flick these up on the screen straight away here. In this particular chiasm, the first one, both aspects, the reds correspond to each other, the ambers correspond, the blues correspond, the uh, browns correspond, and the green is the highlight. The green could be a doublet, by the way, head of the body and church could be two statements there. In the next chiasm the, that we're doing, this one here, the left-hand side, verses 6, 7, and 8, are, ref, reflect one aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ, and verses 9, 10, and 11, an other aspect, or his deity. The first, his humanity. The second, his deity. So this is a really interesting aspect of the structure of texts. Now, the third one I'm going to show you, I've not marked off as a chiasm for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's only a single verse. 
and I'm going to have to go and have a look at, uh, at the documents that are available based on the early manuscripts to see if this single verse is chiastically structured or not. Sometimes the translators set it up that way in a particular single passage of scripture, and it's, um, uh, but it, it doesn't actually appear that way originally, but I will show you the text in just a moment. So what we're seeing here is that these hymns that came into the scriptures at the time of early Christianity, when there were no books, when there were no smartphones, obviously, or internet, barely any libraries, the libraries were in the, in the temples, maybe the synagogues, uh, were used, scriptures like this were used committed to song, and that these songs then, uh, or creeds or chants, were then used when people got together to enforce what we know or what they know constantly. And that's an important component of Christianity. A lot of times you, uh, you might say, well, why does a particular group uh, do responsive reading? One reads and then another replies. Well, that's in scripture. And in acts of worship before God, responsive reading is not at all uncommon. I think God actually requires it. Very interesting. Why do, uh, why do some groups chant? Why do whatever? Well, you can have a look and see. Uh, the early church used it. You see it in ancient uh, times of worship and so on. Uh, they may be a bit foreign to us, but it does not make them bad or wrong and should be understood in their place. Now, what is the third, what is the third uh, hymn that I want to have a look at? This one is found in Paul's letter to Timothy. And it is one verse. Great indeed, we confess, 1 Timothy 3.16, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. This is uh, something you could turn into a, a song, I think, pretty quickly. And I'll just give you the basic chiastic structure, if it exists. The first Instead of going like this in its chiastic structure, it kind of goes this, 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 and then bang, bang, bang. Sort of, it, it, it's, uh, it's a, a one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, if indeed it is a chiastic structure. But let's not dig that deep into this verse, but look again at the passage as we wrap this up here. And here we go. This is this passage again. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness, is how that passage begins. So let's round these three, these three passages out, think about them for a minute, and uh, wrap this up. These are at least three hymns or creeds or statements that were believed to be repeated, held in the memory of people in the early church. So imagine that, um, that your children heard these again and again and again, and you heard them again and again and again. You memorized them. They were just right there. This was a time when there was no other way to store or to hold data, uh, and you relied very much on the reading of scripture that you'd, hear, that you'd hear maybe from um, in the synagogue or someone might have memorized something. So there's a very good way to do that. The content of all of these is extremely interesting. The content is always about the work and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's very important and should not be missed. The Lord Jesus Christ receives honor, receives worship as the Father. I probably need to do a quick video on the doctrine of the Trinity, just a real highlight one, and then dive back into this in future videos so you can kind of understand what's going on. Well, how should our worship today work? It should be Christ-centered. Our worship should concentrate on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. Oftentimes we get together on a Sunday morning or whatever to what we call worship God, and we have a, a bit of a wrong attitude. We think, well, who's the audience for this worship? Well, the audience of the pe is the people in the pew. So then we have um, maybe a couple of musicians. We say, I'm playing to the audience. Actually, that's backwards. As we worship God, 
when we get together to praise him, when we get together to bring him glory, the audience of our worship is God. He's the one who we present worship to. So we don't worship in such a way as to make it uh, enjoyable necessarily or entertaining for the audience. That's completely reversed. We worship in such a way as to bring glory to him. And so our worship is not to be a performance, but it's to be something that's offered. It's an offering to him. So that's really interesting. So this is a look at three hymns, creeds, songs, etc. used very, very likely by Christians before there was written text, before the Bible was available, and was, was used to reinforce, they were used to reinforce the knowledge of who Christ is and what he has done. He's translated us from darkness. He's brought us into his kingdom. He's sharing eternity with us. Now, the Bible says that you must be saved. The Bible talks about the fact that all our sinners, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What's that mean? It means you stand and I stand before God as guilty and without hope. Remember our earliest videos? Without God and without hope in the world. The scripture uses other words, lost. We use it in some of our songs. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind. It's another scriptural concept, but now I see. I'm here to implore you to analyze, to observe, and to respond to the claims of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My name is Al Persson. I'm the pastor at Botany City Church in Sydney. My email address is pastor at mascot dot church it has been my great pleasure to be with you today god bless and come back soon